Today I'm going to talk about getting more out of our alfalfa. There are certain things that we can do to help improve our stand life, our yield, and our quality, our persistence, and that's what we're going to talk about today, what we can actually control. So our agenda today, I'm going to go through these bullet points, uh, alfalfa benefits, how to get a great established stand, how to keep that stand for for our nine to 10 cuts that we wanna aim for, manure application, some fertility tips, and then we've got time at the end for some questions. So starting off with the benefits of alfalfa, of alfalfa, it's really great not only for our soil, for our cows, but the environment as a whole as well. And I think for growers on this call that aren't livestock producers and don't grow alfalfa, it's definitely something to think about um, adding into your crop crop rotation because there's so many benefits even to a cash cropper. Um, this image here shows our, our relative erosion that we'll see depending on what crop we planted. Um, with alfalfa, we do see less erosion, less runoff. So that's the first column there. The, the C stands for corn, S is for soybeans, and A is for alfalfa. So we get the least erosion when we got a corn alfalfa rotation. It's going to help improve our drainage improves our soil till. It fixes its own nitrogen. So that's a bonus, not only for our fertility side, but it's also gonna give us that extra end credit for the next crop. And so typically um, we'll follow with corn. We'll get about a 10 to 15% yield boost following alfalfa from that um, nitrogen that the alfalfa produced on its own. It's great at competing at weeds, It'll help us uh, reduce our pesticide use. We're going to see an increase in wildlife and biological activity. What we'll see in the soil, too, is about 10 to 100 times more activity near the roots, and that's from the rhizobia. Another key thing that's kind of come more to light recently, it does disrupt the life cycle of certain pests like corn rootworm. It's not a host. So that'll be a great break for you know the three four years that we have alfalfa in for pests like that for our cows this is nothing new for for us who are feeding our cows with it it's great quality fiber it has high nutrients and energy source it's got the highest amount of crude protein per acre of any plant or any forage i should say um, and it's, it's used with all classes of livestock whether we're talking heifers dry cows or high producing dairy cows. It's very versatile. So let's get into the nitty gritty. So some tips for getting a great stand established. Firstly, it really, um, what I put together is our, our top five suggestions. And number one would be top yielding genetics with key resistance traits. And I'm gonna go into more details on each of these. We wanna be lining our alfalfa fields if they need it if pH is low. Uh, you want to get, get good seed placement, high seeding rate, and we want to control the weeds as early as possible, whether that's with our population um, or there's definitely some alfalfas available with the Roundup Ready technology. So that's a great uh, way of keeping the weeds out. I should really like Roundup Ready alfalfa, which would be our har the Harvextra traded alfalfa when we're talking summer seeding alfalfa. So let's get into more details on these. So we want to be looking at the disease ratings of the varieties that you're growing. We've got certain root rots and wilts that really affect our, our plants. And many, many of these root rots, they're going to go unnoticed or, or we'll, we'll say, oh, it was a winter kill, because that's what they do look like. But there's, these are the two main root rots. You've got Phytophthora and Phenomyces. We, uh, Phytophthora, you see more with established long-term plant health, having issues with that. When uh, Phenomyces, your seedling plants become chlorotic, stunted, they wilt and die. So that's, again, where we'll get confused with winter kill or not. Essentially, the best way to prevent root rot is have that be part of the seed package with your alfalfa. So have that resistance present. Uh, fungicides don't control the, these rots. This is that establishment, and so the best place is getting it right on the seed. 
we're in the seed. We are dealing with a bit more in Ontario now with reticulum wilt, and and that's uh, a problem. We see it more with longer term stands, and essentially, besides picking varieties that have high resistance, your only other options would be um, a good rotation. You can cut earlier, uh, and then you can also um, not only cut earlier, but wash your equipment from field to field if you have the problems. But again, the, the easiest way to, to help prevent it is getting the resistance right in your genetics. The next thing, and this has such a big play on alfalfa, is pH. pH is really important, not only for nutrient uptake, but also overall yield. Um, and so on the pH, you can see here um, in the bar graph here, ideally for alfalfa, we want to be in that 6.5 to 7 pH. And that's when you'll see most of the nutrients are available for our rhizobia and our roots to, to get up, to pick up. The graph on the left is just showing the yield correlation when our pH is between that six and a half to seven, how big of a difference that's going to impact impact your overall um, yield that you're going to get. When uh, another issue, if we have low pH, not only does that again impact our nutrient uptake, but it can also damage that rhizobia, which then what happens is we can create a nitrogen deficiency, which isn't good. Remember, we want to have these stands for for three years ideally sometimes more and so the the less damage we can do to the root zone the better uh, the ph is going to vary across the field so obviously we recommend soil testing and if you if it's very you know such a variable field it might not hurt to be more specific in where your um, soil testing so you can adjust the rates if needed and the best thing to get a, a well-established field is lime it the year before if it needs it and mix it well into the soil. When we're looking at seeding depth, we it depends on what kind of soils. In general, we're talking about a quarter to half an inch deep, but for sandier soils, even three quarters of an inch is what's recommended. What we wanna make sure is that that seed is getting um, surrounded by soil, so it's got that good seed to soil contact, it doesn't dry out, and it can pick up moisture. The alfalfa seed needs about 100% of its own weight to germinate. So whatever we can do to get that seed to germinate faster, the better off it's going to be. You want a nice, fine, firm seed bed, and there's always that general rule of thumb where once you step in the on the soil, that your boot just sticks, it, sticks down into the heel. Uh, into the soil and that's when you know you've got a good uh, seed to soil contact for that alfalfa seedling. When we're talking about how much to put down, the first thing you do want to look at is your seed tag and see what is the seed coating on that alfalfa because that's going to impact how many pounds of alfalfa you're actually going to put down. So these graphs here are looking at if it's at 9% seed coating. If we have a higher seed coating, we're going to have to bump up our population to get the, the right amount of seeds placed down into the soil. So looking at these graphs, you can see here we have our yield, so tons per acre. We max that out at around 16 pounds per acre. When we look at forage quality, similar thing. Between that 16 to 20 is when we max out the the quality or, or relative forage value. So we really suggest if you're planting alfalfa, a companion crop, you obviously you're gonna have to adjust a little, is planting a minimum of 16 pounds all the way up to 18 or, or 20. Um, again, at the end of the day, we wanna keep these stands for three, three, maybe four years. And so if we start off at a too low of a of a seeding rate, we're going to eventually not have that stand thick enough to, to get our yields. And I'll, I'll show you, this is it's a sad slide, but it's the truth. So of all the alfalfa that we plant, only about 60% of our seeds are going to germinate. 
And then nearly 60% of those seedlings will die of the first year. And that's just the nature of alfalfa. So you can see here, this is a graph. So if we plant it at 15 pounds, um, that means we just have over 70 seeds per square foot. Three to four weeks, we lose about the 60%. And then you can see by the end of the year, we only have about 25 seeds um, or, or plants per, per square foot. And then in two years, we're down to less than, than 10. So the higher we can start off, the longer, the more population we're going to have, which in, in the end gives us a higher yielding, thicker stand, less weed pressure, things like that. So stand persistence. Now that we've got it established well, what are some tips that we can help keep our stand thick and lasting through these years? So what you want to look at too when you're selecting hybrids or hybrids, alfalfa is not a hybrid, when you're selecting varieties is their fall dormancy score and the winter survivability. Those are two different ratings. Fall dormancy, what it looks at is what's the regrowth after um, you've cut it during your last, your last cutting, what's the regrowth like? So it ranges from one to 11. And one is the most dormant, 11 is, is non-dormant. Many of the varieties sold are between that four and five. And so the higher the number, the longer it's going to continue to grow after your last cut. And the graph here at the top just shows you, you usually will get higher yielding alfalfa with the higher number of a fall dormancy score that you have. And that's just because they're quicker also to regrow they're quicker to wake up in the spring. So you want to pick a high fall dormancy scored alfalfa. Winter survivability is, is different. So winter survivability rating, it looks at how, how cold can it tolerate. And alfalfa naturally um, are, are dormant varieties. They do go through a winter hardening process. And this is a chemical process It takes about two weeks and it, it starts when our temperatures start fluctuating from 15 degrees Celsius to zero. And it's gonna convert the starches that are in the, in the roots um, into, or into the crown I should say, into sugars. And that sugar acts as an antifreeze for, for our crown, our crown buds and our roots to survive the winter. They can survive once it's hard enough hardened off to about 15 degrees, minus 15 degrees Celsius, which is quite impressive. Where we start to get the damage to our crown is if we get about four inches deep, if it reaches minus eight degrees, that's when you're gonna get it, run into trouble. So those are two different ratings and you wanna look at both. For fall dormancy, I like it because of the yield, Winter survivability, we obviously want a plant that can withstand colder temperatures. The other thing that really impacts persistency or, or the stand life is how do we treat that alfalfa? There's natural processes we can't help. So drought, for instance, that's gonna impact the persistence, but we have no control over that unless you have an irrigation system. Manure application, we can definitely have an impact on. And so here's a picture that it's not uncommon to see. This was hog manure put on this field when it was a little too wet and we're left with these, with these tracks. The impact of this is that when we get regrowth, and this is a slide from one of Christine Brown's presentations from OMAF, OMAFRA. When we get regrowth on that wheel, the wheel track where we had the damage, you can see it's a lot less because we're it has to start from scratch essentially. Whereas if there's no wheel traffic, you can see we've got growth coming right from the crown, but also from the the apical buds here. And so we're going to get overall more yield. And and you'll see that um, when you're driving around, right? You'll see you'll see exactly if we got on too late or it was too wet, where the tire tracks were. And we just we want to avoid that. Not only does it affect yield, but it's also going to delay the maturity of that alfalfa that is within the, the wheel tracks. So some tips 
Um, you know, try and only use the tractors the size that's necessary. Limit the trips across the field. Use wide swaths to allow the haylage or the hay to dry faster. Because at the end of the day, we really want to be on and off that field in four days. So we cut it to when we apply the manure, we've got a four day interval. So the faster we can get it to dry, the faster we can get it off, the faster we can put on our manure if we're putting it on. Manure is great, don't get me wrong. It's just the timing of it is so crucial. And, and if you have to select fields, you wanna really avoid if you can putting manure on new seeding, just because that crown is a lot weaker. Choose your oldest stands or the ones with the most grass because they have a high nitrogen um, a hungry, they're very nitrogen hungry, the grasses. So remember four days. The other thing that has a big impact on persistence is when did we last cut our alfalfa? And there's, you know, we've always talked about the critical harvest window and we've set a date. And as you can see, here's the map of Ontario. So for many of us, we're talking August 30th. After that, you don't want to cut your alfalfa. I got questions a lot this year on, should I still cut, should I not? Because we had a, a great stand of alfalfa still, you know, look, you know, gonna yield well, but it was starting to be into that September zone. These, the dates in this map, they're just, you know, they're averages of, of when it's usually safe to stop or when we want to stop cutting. It's not the date that's as important, but really what we need is we need 500 growing degree units between cutting and our first killing frost, which is minus four degrees, to have enough regrowth to have it survive the winter. So August 30th, 30th is roughly, you know, the long-term range of when, how long that takes till we get the 500 growing degree units. But there's some falls where we we get that growing degree units to 500, you know, in, in a shorter time frame. So you might get away with cutting into that first week of September some years, but use it as a guideline. And we really don't want to cut too late because if we don't get enough sugars into our alfalfa, it's gonna have a hard time surviving the winter because it needs that time to, to harden off. And here's just a graph that shows you how much carbohydrates are in the root reserves of our alfalfa plant. So consider the reserves in our alfalfa root as the refrigerator for our plants over the winter. They need food to survive in the winter. Yes, they're, they're not growing, but they're still alive. And so you can see once our alfalfa is cut until it's about six to eight inches, it uses the reserves from those roots. And that's just because we don't have the biomass yet to fix its own um, food source and get it growing as well. Um, just because again, we don't have that mass yet. After the plant reaches about six to eight inches, then it has an, it's gonna start to rebuild its reserves. And so the worst time for our, our alfalfa to get a frost in the fall is when our alfalfa is about that six to eight inches. And so you, that's why we have this critical fall harvest period where we're no cut window that we really wanna try and get the alfalfa out of that um, zone here. So if we can get it to bud, even if there's some purple, that's okay. The other side of it is yes, you can go, you can cut closer to the frost so that we don't initiate any growth. So we're not taking out any of those reserves yet. The hard part of that is do we know when that frost is going to be? And then you also want to leave some extra um, stems, like so cut it a bit higher so there's better chance of getting snow covered on that field because we want to protect it. Um, something to catch that snow to protect our soil temperatures. So there, there are those two options. And this year definitely got asked many times, can I cut, can I not? To me, it depends a bit how old the stand is. Do you want, you know, what you don't cut this fall, you're gonna gain that come first cut. So in most cases, I would say hold off and, and let, um, let us reap the benefits next year. 
what we can do come spring time here. So in a couple months, to see how well our, our alfalfa did make through the winter is do a stand evaluation. And so you can, uh, just using a square foot, you can either do stem counts or plant counts. Plant counts are recommended the earlier in the season. Once the alfalfa reaches about six inches, then stem counts um, is what I like to do more because it doesn't matter which year we're in, um, you're just counting how many stems. And if we're getting more than 55 stems per square foot, we, we're gonna get our maximum yield from that stand. If we're between the 40 and 50 stems, that's when you wanna look at the crown, make sure it's all night, or nice and white and juicy. That's a healthy crown. The picture here, you can see, excuse me, we've got some browning here, that's a, a rot. And so if we're seeing that, and we're only in that 40 to 50 um, plants per square foot or stems per square foot, thinking of getting that rotated is, is, is what I would be suggesting. Of course, you wanna look at multiple locations across the field. If it's just one small spot, um, you, know, uh, you know, you can keep it, but if it's the majority of your field, it's time to get that um, rotated out. So moving on to fertility, and this is a biggie. Um, so pH can count as fertility, of course, but this is more looking at the nutrients. And the first thing to do is to soil test. We need to know where we're starting off. And so that, that, that is so important, and not only soil test, but if you are using manure as a source of fertilizer as well, it is a good idea to get that tested to know what you're working with on a nutrient level because they can vary so much, uh, the different types of manure. Here's a chart just showing the removal rates of the different nutrients when the, with our alfalfa, whether it's on a per pound, pounds per ton basis, or a yearly removal rate. So like I said, we need to soil test so we know where we're starting off. And then we also need to know how much are we actually removing. So getting a good handle on our actual yield can be quite important um, and help you be as efficient as possible with your fertilizer application, whether that's through manure or commercial. So we've got, uh, you can see if we, if we take, let's say we are getting six tons of dry matter yield, which is really high. We're really, you know, I'd, I'd be happy with that yield you can see that we're removing 360 pounds of potash. Alfalfa has such a high requirement. And so we really wanna be making sure we're, we're maintaining our application of, of potash um, with most soils um, throughout the years to keep that alfalfa yielding high. Uh, you can see it's also a big nitrogen user. Luckily, like I said earlier, it does fix its own nitrogen. Now there has been some studies showing that establishment adding some nitrogen um, in the fertilizer is, is not a bad thing, just a little um, to help get that, uh, that plant going. You don't wanna add too much because you don't wanna limit the rhizobia, um, what they will do. If they have too much nitrogen, then they're not gonna work as hard. And then also sulfur, that's become a bigger, uh, a bigger thing we need to make sure we're adding to our blends. And I'll talk more about that. So if we are relying a lot on manure, again, a test is important for that as well. But here's approximately what 10 tons of liquid dairy manure will give you. So it'll replace um, the potash removal of one ton of alfalfa dry matter, but only three tons um, to offset the, the phosphorus. Because um, you can see we, we remove a lot less phosphorus than we do potash. And so we really need to be careful when manure is our large source of fertilizer that we don't over apply our, our um, potassium or our phosphorus. On the sulfur side of things, uh, about three pounds of sulfur is what you'll get out of a thousand gallons of manure, um, or that equates to a pound per one ton, one ton of dry manure. So manure is great. Remember timing is important, but in many cases, uh, we need to be topping up, especially our, our potash to get our, our, our removal rates 
accomplished or, or filled. So phosphorus is really important for our early seedling growth, whereas potassium, it really drives our yield and our winter survivability and stand persistence. When um, you, you won't likely see a response in phosphorus application if our soil test is above 15 parts per million and with potash if, if it's over 150 parts per million. Again, we need to soil test. With the potassium, alfalfa is a luxury consumer, so it's going to consume whatever you apply, so we don't want to put too much on. Um, so they recommend not to exceed the 200 pounds per application, just so we're not um, taking up more than when we're putting on more than we actually need. Especially we have to be cautious if it's for dry cows, but we can, you know, we can take older stands or leave them out longer if it is for dry cows. What the deficiencies look like. So potassium is actually the most common deficiency we see in alfalfa. That's what it looks like here, uh, the yellow speckled, and it will start at the bottom of the leaves and work its way up to the newer growth. Phosphorus deficiency, it's a bit harder to tell, but the leaves will turn darker and sometimes even purple uh, towards the newer growth. So that's what the deficiencies look like. So you can keep an eye out for that. Um, on the sulfur side, the deficiency, it looks a lot like nitrogen deficiency. So it can be hard to tell, but you'll get poor top growth. There'll be spindly plants. Um, and it, it's going to be yellowing of the upper leaves. The picture here will just show the nice clear difference of where sulfur was not applied versus where it was. Sulfur needs to be applied in the sulfate form, or if you're applying elemental sulfur, you want to do that at establishment just so it has enough time to get into the sulfate um, form for that plant to then utilize throughout the, the life of the alfalfa. Applying it in the spring, like like the other, um, we, we always get asked when do we put fertilizer on, and so spring is best or after first cut, just so we're able to to use up um, that fertilizer for our existing years or um, our our next cut, um, and also reduce losses of leaching for um, things like sulfur or if you're adding nitrogen. It is also going to boost your first cut yield, which is tends to be our, our best yielding and best quality alfalfa. If um, you do suspect sulfur deficiency, a soil test um, is not the route you want to go. You want to do a, a tissue sample. And so here's just a chart showing what um, what the different, uh, whether it's manure, fertilizer, what the blends are, and, and what you need. Because again. On average, sulfur, um, each ton of alfalfa produced requires about five pounds of sulfur. It's one of the higher needs of alfalfa and, and um, canola are the two plants that need a high amount of sulfur compared to others. One nutrient I want to touch on is boron. And so this year we did see some boron deficiency. Boron deficiency um, it, it looks a lot like leafhopper, and we also had leafhopper damage this year. So we were getting the two um, at the same time, and sometimes we were confusing which one was which. But with boron, um, it's going to show up in the upper leaves, and it's going to be yellow, reddening. You don't get that V pattern as much as you do with the leafhopper. And uh, it also... Boron becomes less, it doesn't get used up as well in a drought condition. So in many places where we had boron deficiency, it wasn't that we actually had a boron deficiency in our soils. It was because it couldn't get it because of the, the drought. But um, where it is required, um, it, it, the, if we need it, it's going to help increase our yield and our persistence of that, that stand. And alfalfa does have a high boron requirement. Uh, and you can add the boron when you're applying your P and K. So that, that's a nice benefit of that. 
So that's all I have. Um, again, at the end of the day, there, there's different factors that we can do and control to make our alfalfa yield high um, and get our quality there and our, our persistence. And then there's things that are out of our control. But um, keeping in mind those tips that we went through should help us get to high yielding stand uh, for many years. Thanks, everyone. Morning, everyone. Uh, as Scott and Lydia had mentioned, my name is Dennis Coffey. I'm a sales agronomist with the Holmes Agri team out of Stainer. Uh, and I'd just like to thank Martina for uh, her talk on uh, getting most out of the forages. Uh, and at this time, uh, I'll be able to relay a couple questions uh, to Martina. So we had one come in. Uh, what's your experience with uh, no-tilling uh, alfalfa seeding? Uh, and what are your tips to um, to ensure more success? Yeah, so there's definitely some people that try no tilling. I think to me, it's, it's riskier. There's definitely benefits, right? As, as we heard in our first presentation, but um, for me, we want to really establish that alfalfa well and have it maintained for three years. So I, I don't promote no tilling per se. I like to have a nice clean seed bed so we get good seed placement. Um, just so we get a good established stand or, or it's less riskier. But if you're going to do no-till, um, we definitely, you know, control the weeds before we go in and uh, make sure we're getting that, that plant, the seed planted um, into the soil, but not too deep, which can be a risk. Um, so it, those would be like the, the top two, but I, I like seeing a, a nice clean field uh, before we put in alfalfa, but not saying that it can't be done. Right, perfect. Uh, and just, I uh, would get your experience with uh, fungicides, any studies that you've done, uh, your response, uh, does it work? Is it beneficial? Application timings, benefits? Yeah, just through fungicides on alfalfa. Yeah, so I, I will start with, I think more research needs to be done in this area. We, Pioneer and Corteva have done research um, for many years in the past. Now we haven't done, um, we didn't do any last year per se, but um, it, what we found is like every six to eight years, it pays to use. So I'm not convinced yet that it's something that we need to do every year. When we look at the data, um, that's what it shows us. And what we need to find out is what are we actually targeting? Are we targeting leaf diseases or are we targeting root rots? In many cases, we're having root rot issues and not actual leaf um, diseases. When we looked at some Harvextra data, so that was, that's the low lignin Roundup Ready Alfalfa, where we looked at putting on fungicides um, at regular, so if we cut it every 28 days, and about 25% of the time, there was a response to fungicides. Fungicides will make it look nicer. It'll look like there's more leaves, but when we actually take the yield and quality data, we weren't finding the difference. When we left that stand out longer, so about 35 to 38 days, then we were starting to see a higher response with fungicides. So I do think that more data, we need to do more research on it, but I don't think it's something that I would be doing every year to my alfalfa. Right, makes sense. Uh, just one last question on uh, sulfur availability. Uh, how available is sulfur in manure as compared to uh, the sulfate form or elemental um, forms of sulfur? Uh, that's a great question. I, I can't tell you specifically. Um, I can look that up. I do know like elemental sulfur, that's the slowest release um, form of sulfur. So, you know, if you're going to use elemental sulfur, you want to put that down when you're establishing the stand. So over the three years, it has time to um, convert and, and get released. Um, but as for the manure, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. No worries. Perfect. I think that's all the time we have for questions, Martina. So just thanks again for your talk on uh, getting the most out of alfalfa and uh, for joining us for questions today. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. At this